house in the east end of London is surrounded by police with guns. Inside were the two men wanted for questioning about four murders. Tonight they're in custody at separate police stations. The men's hideout was discovered at lunchtime. It's thought the police were acting on a tip-off. James Anderson, who's 25, and Michael Jameson, 23, were upstairs in a private house in Cecil Road, Plasto. The area was immediately evacuated as a shot was fired and a window smashed. After an hour, the men gave themselves up. Christopher Powell was there. At 1.30 today, police converged on Cecil Street. Marksmen surrounded number 60, and shortly afterwards, a single shot was fired. Police had warned that the two men could be dangerous. The shot was inside and no one was hurt. Neighbours had either been evacuated or told to stay indoors. Covered by marksmen, Detective Constable John Cathero, who's been trained to negotiate with gunmen, began talking to the two men through a barricaded door. After an hour, he'd persuaded them to surrender. Two police cars drove up and there were a few tense moments as Anderson and Jameson came out into the street. Get back! Before they gave themselves up, the men threw a Hungarian handgun from an upstairs window. The police say the operation was a complete success, but how dangerous had it been? In my uh, professional view, let me say that it's a self-evident fact that there have been four deaths and one near death in London in recent times which are associated with the matter that you're inquiring into today. A potentially a very dangerous situation. For the neighbours, it was an alarming experience. It was just confusion because my brother ran outside and, you know, come outside because he was going to go out and buy something and the policeman was there at the corner of the gate and he said, Mom, he says, there's a gunman outside, you know, a man with a gun and he said, you know, get inside. So my brother ran back inside with me and my mum sort of panicking. We come out through the front and we locked the, all the doors, you know. The two men are now being questioned in separate police stations and it's unlikely that they'll be charged for the next two days. The Welsh boxer Johnny Owen is still critically ill in the California hospital after brain surgery following a knockout in his world title fight in Los Angeles. An hour ago, the hospital said he was fighting for his life and that his condition was critical. A term, says our correspondent there, which this hospital uses only when the prognosis isn't favourable. David Cass watched the fight on satellite and reports on the way Owen was knocked down three times by the world bantamweight champion Lupe Pintor of Mexico. Owen, wearing the red shorts, had given a good account of himself. He seemed ahead on points well into the fight. Then the Mexican champion, Pintor, caught him for the first knockdown. <laughs> Owen didn't seem badly hurt. He responded to the referee's compulsory count and was able to fight back. Then came the half a minute of boxing that was to end so unfortunately. Again, Owen was felled by a right-hand blow. The slow-motion replay showed that the blow was a more solid one than the first, and that perhaps Owen got up too quickly and too bravely. The final knockdown came almost at once. The referee didn't count, he immediately stopped the fight and took out Owen's gun shield. The crowd, who are almost all Mexicans and supporters of Pintor, cheered as the champion celebrated the retention of his title. It was only later, when Pintor realised how badly his opponent had been hurt, that he said he was very, very sorry. But it is a sport and there was nothing I could do, he said. The slow motion showed how the third right-hand blow knocked Owen unconscious at once. He lost all control of his limbs and his head bounced off the canvas. Owen was taken by stretcher straight to hospital for a four-hour operation to remove blood clots from his brain and relieve pressure on it. 
The result of the fight was cruel reward for Johnny Owen's dedication. He's recognized as the keenest boxer in the world, training seven days a week. He was asked what, in his heart of hearts, he thought would happen in the fight. <laughs> I couldn't say who could say how you got a stronger Gemini. <laughs> I got a 50-50 chance that you win in it. So I think, you know, I'm just as good as him, he's just as good as me. But he's got a title, so I gotta go that little bit extra to take it off him. Iran has called up thousands of military reservists for the rapidly growing border fighting with Iraq. There's been land and air fighting for some days over the disputed Shat al-Arab region, where the Iraqis say they've been under shell fire. It's the waterway running between the two countries and linking the Gulf with Iran's huge oil refinery at Abadan. Iraq has just ended the treaty giving Iran right of way, and today there's been a battle between gunboats with some lost on each side. 1,500 anti-NATO demonstrators in West Germany marched this morning to the headquarters at Hildesheim of the big military maneuvers, Crusader 80, in which British troops are taking part. Various protest groups included German communists who want the troops out. Michael Burke was there. This, potentially the most dangerous battle during the entire NATO exercise, was left to the German riot police. The British troops were all locked into their barracks or hidden away. 2,000 police, armed with shields, truncheons and guns, backed by dogs and cavalry, made what the Germans obviously thought was a far more formidable show of strength than anything NATO has managed so far. The demonstrators certainly thought so, their banners read down with NATO, their slogans an impressively wide selection of protests from up the IRA to a curious demand for the Americans to get out of Afghanistan. And this maneuver here on which we are demonstrating again is a dress rehearsal for this world war. There had been real fears that the masked anarchists amongst the demonstrators might try to storm the British barracks but so overwhelming was the police presence that the protesters just marched away again. The police went home and the British army could go back to war. Over Holland, British and American soldiers were dropped near Arnhem to commemorate one of the Allies' most ill-fated battles of the Second World War. Then, 30,000 men, including Canadians and Poles, dropped behind the lines to try to open up Germany by capturing the Rhine bridges. But they landed amid panzers, and more than half were lost. Today, 120 dropped, watched by veterans, many of whom are staying at Arnhem with the Dutch families who sheltered them after the battle for the bridge that was too far. The Soviet communist newspaper, Pravda, has launched an attack on the United States, West Germany, and NATO. It warned them not to try to help workers in Poland. In London today, thousands of Poles living in exile attended a memorial service for Polish officers and men who were murdered in the Katyn Forest during the last war. Richard Whitmore reports. To the Poles, this annual commemoration of the 1940 Katyn massacre is an event when they not only remember the 14,000 Polish officers who died, but also try yet again to get international justice to condemn Russia for the atrocities. So far, that's not happened. Although as far back as 1951, an American House of Representatives committee laid the blame at the door of the Russian Secret Service. The Russians have always blamed Nazi Germany for the massacre. Successive British governments have fought shy of commenting on the Polish call for justice. Although the present government feels it right to send a representative to the memorial service as a mark of respect for those who died. With the world's attention focused on Poland's struggle for trade union freedom, Patriotism among Polish exiles is stronger than for a long time, and this was reflected today by the several thousand who turned up from many parts of the country. Jackie Gillett, the writer and broadcaster, has been found dead at her home near Bruton in Somerset. She was 41. She was found dead in bed by her husband, television producer John Percival, just before midnight. The cause isn't known. A set of Jackie Gillett's short stories appeared this year, and she'd written a number of novels and non-fiction books. But she was first known to the public as one of ITN's early women reporters. Now, with the rest of Saturday's sport, here's David Cass again. With very little crowd trouble around the country today, footballers and real fans have been able to concentrate on the game. Fine performances in the first division took Ipswich further ahead and helped Nottingham Forest leap from fourth to second place. 
Southampton and Liverpool shared the points from their game. Scottish international John Walk is the star of the week. He scored both goals as Ipswich beat Coventry. He's netted seven times since last Saturday. Mark Wallington, Leicester's goalkeeper, suffered from the skills of Nottingham Forest. He was beaten five times, with four goals coming in the last 15 minutes. Gary Bertles, who's still on Forest's transfer list, got two of them. I watched an action-packed game between Aston Villa and local rivals Wolverhampton Wanderers. Villa looked the more positive side from the start and took only three minutes to turn slack marking into a goal as the Wolves' defence allowed Tony Morley too much freedom. Even before the own goal, there'd been evidence of indiscipline and indecision by Wolves defenders in their, in their own penalty area. Both sides displayed skill and physical strength. The difference was that Villa put flowing moves together. This one involved six players in 15 seconds and was one of several which could have brought a goal. The second half and Wolves almost equalised. Foiled by Ken McNaught's goal line clearance and an offside decision against George Berry. The real equaliser came after a tenacious piece of soccer from Wayne Clark. Villa will say Alan Evans should have intercepted, but Eve scored anyway. Villa and David Geddes deserved the winner. Geddes had made some brilliant running onto long passes all afternoon. In injury time, Wolves fans thought they should have been awarded a penalty for the handball by Alan Evans just coming up. The referee was unsighted and the score remained Villa 2, Wolves 1. In the Scottish Premier Division, John McDonald hit a hat-trick for Rangers in their record 8-1 victory over Kilmarnock. That puts Rangers at the top of the table on goal average. Surprisingly, Celtic dropped a home point to newly promoted Airdrie in a one-all draw. Sheffield Wednesday today played the first of their four home games under the FA ban on their supporters using the standing enclosures. Sheffield's terraces have been closed because of the riot during their game against Oldham two weeks ago. All the same, 15,000 fans turned up to watch Sheffield beat Queen's Park Rangers 1-0. At Cardiff, Welsh Rugby Union began their centenary celebrations with a 32 to 25 points win over an overseas 15. You don't often see a fullback scoring a try, and you very seldom see one scoring three. But that's what Roger Blythe did today for Wales. The commentator, Bill McLaren. It's Jeff Wheelow feet, Brynmore Williams running wide. A long pass out there to Daniels. Daniels over the 22, going for the corner. Slips five metres short. Once again, Brynmore Williams, Alan Phillips. Fenwick, there is a huge overlap here. Out to Blythe. Blythe must score the first try of the match. Four points to nil, Wales are ahead. Renaud Williams, Gareth Davis, Gravel on the sweep, and again it's Blythe. Oh, what a lovely day he's having. Phillips didn't quite strike that one right, but uh, been a bit of help there from the flank forward ringer to direct it. That's Davis. There's Ray Gravel. Gravel on the switch move. The, the crash ball, as it were. This is Blythe, the fullback, and Blythe is going to score his third try. At Newbury in the Mill Reef Stakes, there was a fine finish to the six furlong sprint. Our commentator, Peter O'Sullivan. Racing down into the final furlong, Sweet Monday on the far side, Matterboy on the near side, and it's Sweet Monday with the advantage now from Matterboy and Paul Dew. Sweet Monday from Matterboy and Paul Dew as they race up towards the line. Sweet Monday from Matterboy and Paul Dew. That looks as though how they're going to finish. Sweet Monday racing clear as they come up towards the line. Sweet Monday wins it from Matterboy in second and Paul Dew third. So Sweet Monday a clear winner with Lester Piggott on Matterboy a good second. In the America's Cup series of yacht races, the challenger, Australia, has levelled the score to one all, and she's the first boat to beat the Americans for ten years. Australia led for much of the day, but she made one error and allowed America's freedom to slip by. The result was in doubt almost till the end of the race, when she crossed the line just seconds ahead of freedom. And finally, school children in Basingstoke are hunting for pieces of the American Hornet jet fighter that crashed in Hampshire two weeks ago. They'll get a thousand pounds reward for pieces of a turbine wheel. It is roughly 12 inches long, five inches thick. It should be split up into either three or four sections. The United the States Navy believe this piece will tell them why the plane suffered uh, engine failure over Basingstoke. If it's not found, they may have to redesign part of the Hornet's engine. So, for the Americans, a thousand pounds for a few bits of metal is not much. It could save them hundreds of thousands. For the children of Basingstoke, it's a rich reward.
And that's the news tonight. Good night.